Welcome everyone for uh, today's Grand Rounds and thank you for being here either in person or online. And uh, today uh, we will have Cardiology Grand Rounds. We will, uh, it'd be hopefully one of a series. So we don't wanna uh, do that a one time thing. And uh, Dr. Uh, Nupur Shah, she's one of uh, our senior fellows. Uh, she's from actually Livonia, Michigan. She went to uh, St. Mary's Hospital for her residency and did a chief resident here at NYC in health in New York. And she's going to be talking to us about management of chronic heart failure that's based on the guidelines from last year, 2022. And uh, so we're going to shrink that to the chronic heart failure management, actually, in the mostly the outpatient setting. And I think other fellows are going to be trying to present on the inpatient and uh, the advanced heart failure in the uh, in, in coming brain rounds. So, Nipur. Thank you so much, Dr. Omar, for the introduction. So I'm gonna, like Dr. Omar said, I'm gonna present on the management of chronic heart failure. Um, he already introduced me, I'm PGY6 in cardiology. Um, so starting, I have no disclosures associated with my presentation. First, talking about what is heart failure. So it's a complex clinical syndrome with symptoms and signs that results from structural and functional abnormality, either with the filling of the heart or ejection of the blood from the heart. So more than the disease itself, it, the patient's present with a syndrome of clinical symptoms and signs, which you have to always look out for. It is a growing health concern and economic burden for the United States. In 2017, there were 1.2 million heart failure hospitalizations in the United States among almost 1 million patients with diagnosis of heart failure. So that is almost a 26% increase in the heart failure hospitalization from 2013 to 2017. From 2000 to 2013, the rise was not this much high, but lately it has been growing every year. Uh, every year, there's an increase of 20% increase in hospitalization in the heart failure rates. So that is why this is a growing concern that we all need to know and manage appropriately. Uh, this is a slide I'm going to present and talk about the causes of the heart failure. Um, I'm going to focus on what are the common causes and what are some of the other causes which Every patient, it's not too uncommon, but we should be uh, specific for every patient about that. So in the U.S., a large proportion of the population have hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerotic cardio cardiovascular disease, and obesity. So that constitutes almost 150 million of the U.S. population already at the diagnosis of stage A heart failure, which is at-risk heart failure. The common causes for heart failure are ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, hypertension, and valvular heart disease. These are the most common ones you, we, we see in the hospital as well as in the outpatient setting. Other common causes that you should be looking out for is familiar or genetic cardiomyopathy. Especially for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, the familiar or genetic component is very common. Most common cause of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, they present with dilated cardiomyopathy. Amylodosis uh, in the population in Mobile, we see that because we have an older uh, geriatric population. If they are coming with dyspnea on exertion, they have HFPEF, uh, amylodosis should always be in your mind to diagnose, especially if they have carpal, carpal tunnel syndrome or spinal stenosis, macroglossia, symptoms like that should trick your mind that, okay, maybe I should work this patient for amylodosis. Everybody must be aware of the low voltage on the EKG and mild LVH or any LVH on the echocardiogram that tells us that there is some protein deposition in the myocardium, which is not shown as the LVH on the EKG. So those are some of the some signs and symptoms we should be looking for. Substance abuse, again, we see that a lot. Alcohol use causing dilated cardiomyopathy, cocaine, methamphetamine, patients coming in with and have cardiomyopathy. Tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy with the AFib RVR, which is prolonged, uncontrolled, that can cause cardiomyopathy. Patients who have pacing, RV pacing cardiomyopathy is common, uh, uncommon actually. And then stress induced cardiomyopathy, which is also known as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy or a broken heart syndrome. So that is also seen. Peripartum cardiomyopathy, that also seems lately since last couple of years that it's been in rise. Uh, peripartum is mainly during the pregnancy period and six months postpartum. Uh, so that is also, if you are seeing a patient, obstetric history actually comes with our cardiovascular family history and personal history and social history. Obstetric is equally important. What is their gravida, para, how many abortions they had, and if they had a history of peripartum cardiomyopathy, it's very important that they can have a recurrence of it. 
chemotherapy induced cardio cardiotoxicity with the new drugs uh it's been still seen uh we know the trastuzumab and uh the anthracyclines have very common are very commonly known for developing cardiotoxicity. So if patients are on chemotherapy, that's something that we should be looking for. Hemochromatosis, it can cause dilated cardiomyopathy as well. And thyroid disease, um, especially for the population who are coming here, check thyroid function tests to make sure they're not having thyroid abnormalities. Um, this is the slide I'll be talking about the stages of the heart failure. Stage A is at risk for heart failure. This is where the patients does not have any structural abnormality. They do not have any symptoms, but they have the risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, the risk factors we talked about. Then comes stage B heart failure, which is a pre-heart failure. Here, the patients would have structural heart disease. Their EF can be low. They can have elevated LV filling pressures, but they are not having symptoms. So this stage A and stage B are the reversible category of heart failure. This is the time where we can do risk factor modification and try to convert them back. Once they are stage C, which is symptomatic heart failure, they have structural abnormality along with developing symptoms, that's an irreversible stage. So now that there starts the GDMT and all therapy. Stage D is the advanced heart failure. That is a category where patients have marked heart, heart failure symptoms, recurrent hospitalization, despite the maximum tolerated GDMT that they are on. And then that, that's the stage where we talk about either palliative care approach or advanced therapies. NYJ classification. So talking about NYJ classification, it is very important because of it is an independent predictor of mortality and it has a significant role in deciding the eligibility of the patient for treatment strategies. We all are aware about it, but just going through it quickly, NYHA 1 is no symptoms with normal physical activity. 2 is where you develop mild symptoms with slight limiting in the functional status. 3 is moderate symptoms with marked limitation of the functional set status. And 4 is severe symptoms where the symptoms are even at rest. Uh, this is the latest classification of the heart failure. Um, HEF-REF is the LVEF less than 40%. Now they have also come with hef impef, which is an improved EF. So once they have a history of hef ref, you started that amount GDMT. Now their EF is improved to more than forty percent. They have they fall in this category of hef impef. Hef mref is also a new category which comes between EF of forty one to forty nine percent, and hef pef is EF more than fifty percent. So this classification is important again for treatment perspective. This is a HEF-PEF score. We don't use that often, but it is a useful score, especially when patients are coming with dyspnea on exertion and where you are trying to figure out if there is a HEF-PEF likelihood or a pulmonary issue going on, then this score can guide you because uh, so the score mainly focuses on the body mass index, more than 30, more the patient has history of hypertension, are on more than two antihypertensive medications. They have atrial fibrillation. That's the biggest risk factor that gets three points pulmonary hypertension history, if they are more than 60 years of age, and if their filling pressures are high on the echocardiogram where uh, there are certain criteria, E by E prime, if it is more than nine, that comes that gets one point. So if the score is less than two, there is low likelihood of having diagnosis of HEFPEF. If it's more than six, very high likelihood. And if it's in between, then there are further tests that we can do to de develop a diagnosis of HEFPEF or something else. So these are the important... Sorry, I missed one slide. Yeah. These are the important things to note for the diagnosis. A three generation family history is very important to ask uh, because, family, like I talked about, familial cardiomyopathy is the most common cause of non ischemic cardiomyopathy. NYHA classification is very important. Whenever the patient gets a diagnosis of heart failure, they should get the staging, ACC staging, and the NYHA classification where they fall in because that helps with the prognostication. Initial labs, when you see a patient where you're suspecting heart failure uh, at inpatient or outpatient would be CBC, BMP, urine analysis, lipid profile, liver function test, ion studies, and thyroid function test. Again, these are all mainly to diagnose the cause for the heart failure. A 12 lead EKG and a, a transthoracic echocardiogram at initial encounter is a must. If the transthoracic echocardiogram is inadequate because of the body habitus or the patient are on ventilator or something, then there if the facility has these options, then cardiac MRI or cardiac CT are the options to evaluate for the ejection fraction. 
BNP can support the diagnosis of heart failure, but normal levels do not exclude the diagnosis because if the patients are obese, there, there can be falsely normal BNP levels. And there are multiple factors if, the, if they are on some medications that can also give you falsely normal med, uh, BNP. Uh, but if, if it is elevated and the patients are having symptoms, that supports your diagnosis. Uh, if they should have an evidence of increased LV filling pressure, either at rest or at exertion, this can be documented by echocardiogram or doing a right heart cath. This is very important, especially because the diagnosis of HEFPEF is very challenging. Dyspnea on exertion is a very common symptom that patients can have multiple differential diagnosis to it. So if they are having symptoms on exertion, they're not going to have LV filling pressures high at rest. So that would be the time if your suspicion is high, they should get either a stress test with echocardiogram or invasive hemodynamics with a right heart cath to further support the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And in selected ambulatory patients, we do a six minute walk test or a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which is helpful in determining the appropriateness of the advanced therapy. This is for the stage D heart failure. If they can walk on a treadmill, CPAT is preferred. If not, we do six minute walk test. This again helps in deciding whether they qualify for the advanced therapy or just palliative management. So that was the background of the heart failure. Now coming to our topic of management of the chronic heart failure. So first is stage A heart failure that we talked about at risk. Here we focus on the primary prevention. So based on the 2022 AHA, ACC and Heart Failure Society guidelines, the important point I want to focus is when you see a patient, if they are hypertension, the goal blood pressure to maintain would be less than 130 over 80. If they are diabetic, the goal HbA1c should be less than 7%. If they're diabetic, try using SGLT2 inhibitors because they, the, it has a favorable outcome. With all the new studies that have come lately, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are very useful from cardiovascular perspective. Physical activity, the guidelines recommend doing a 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity exercise um, so that patients should be rec counseled about doing that. Maintaining healthy diet and healthy weight, maintaining the weight itself, and then avoid smoking. Smoking is worse for cardiovascular disease and I'm sure for every other disease as well. So when you tell the patients what is a healthy diet, this is a summary of what healthy diet means. Sodium restriction is the most important thing. It comes with the DASH diet as well. Uh, DASH diet is mainly restricting sodium, increasing your potassium, magnesium, calcium, and then it has an overlap with the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and the Mediterranean diet gets um, has been awarded as the best diet for cardiovascular disease. So based on the 2013 guidelines, the, the goal that you give for sodium restriction would be less than 2,400 milligram per day. And if they need further benefit from heart or blood pressure perspective, then less than 1,500 milligram per day has more benefit. On the right, there is a Mediterranean pyramid, which, which, you show, which is showing that Usually in the Mediterranean diet, they do a daily intake of cheese, yogurt, olive oil, fruits, beans, legumes, nuts, vegetables, bread, pasta, rice, couscous. So these are the diet that if consumed as a one serving every day, that is beneficial and healthy from cardiac perspective. A few times a week, fish, poultry, eggs, and sweets are fine. But the worst is the red meat. Any ultra processed food, any red meat, hot dogs, that, that, that's the worst for cardiovascular disease. So patients should just restrict it or minimize it to a few times a month. For weight management, and this is based on 2013 guidelines, uh, when the patient falls into the category of a BMI between 25 to 35, those will be the category where waist circumference should be measured. If the women are having more than 88 centimeter or more than 35 inches, or men having more than 102 centimeter or more than 40 inches, that's indicative of increased cardiovascular risk. And that also helps you uh, die, put, give more therapy based on that. The initial law, goal of the weight loss would should be 5 to 10% of the weight loss uh, within the first six months. And then you should be having counseling session for the lifestyle management accordingly. Moving on to the stage B heart failure, which is a pre-heart failure where the patients have a structurally abnormal heart, but they have not developed symptoms yet. So all the recommendations that we talked in stage A also applies to stage B. But in addition, based on the guidelines, whenever they have an EF less than 40% and they are asymptomatic, it is recommended to start ACE inhibitor and beta blockers. If they are intolerant to ACE inhibitor, ARBs are a uh, 
in an alternative to the management. And if they're post-MI, then in addition to the ACE inhibitor and beta blockers, statin should be added for the regimen. Doing these things actually prevents the development of symptomatic stage C heart failure. Um, so this is a summary slide of uh, management of stage A and stage B heart failure. So patients with hypertension manage the blood pressure. Goal would be less than 130 over 80. Patient with diabetes start SGLT2 inhibitor. A1C goal should be less than 7%. With patients with cardiovascular disease should be on aspirin and statin. Patients with exposure to cardiotoxic agents should get a multidisciplinary uh, meeting. The oncologist the, uh, and the cardiologist should be managing the patient at the same time. Patients who have first degree relatives of patients, genetic and familial or inherited cardiomyopathy should get genetic screening and counseling. For stage B, if they have EF is less than 50%, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, if intolerant to ACE inhibitor, then ARBs. And even if they are not symptomatic, but if they fall in stage B category, if their EF is less than 30%, they are 40 days post MI, then they qualify as a class one indication to get an ICD. So those are the things to keep in mind. Moving to the stage C heart failure. Uh, unfortunately, now the patient has landed into the stage C, but we still have many drugs which are have proven to decrease morbidity and mortality. So we'll be talking about that. Stage C, we usually do two parts to the therapy. One is the non-pharmacological treatment, which is equally important as pharmacological treatment. Education is the key. Patients should know what GDMT means. They should know how to take the medications, how to uptight with the medication, how often to follow. Um, they should know what to look for, like signs and symptoms of heart failure. If they are developing pedal edema or worsening shortness of breath, they should know steps what to do after they develop that and uh, what medicines to take. Restricting sodium intake, physical activation, getting vaccination is equally important. Actually, influenza vaccine has proven to decrease mortality in heart failure uh, patients. Cardiac rehabilitation. In the US, that's the most underutilized uh, resource, uh, sometimes because of the lack of understanding, sometimes because of the insurance issues. But cardiac rehabilitation is very important. It improves functional capacity exercise duration, a quality of life per se. And that includes a medical evaluation, education on the importance of medication adherence, diet, lifestyle, psychosocial support in, and exercise training. So it, it is a summary of everything that you want your patients to get. And cardiac rehab, you can start from as early as stage B heart failure. And it is helpful until the patients are ambulatory and able to do things. Uh, starting with our first guideline-directed medical therapy, which is ACE and ARB, it has been uh, there for years. Uh, this is the meta-analysis uh, that's showing how ACE inhibitors have actually proven to decrease hospitalization and decrease mortality. On the right, again, there were multiple trials done to prove that if they are intolerant to ACE, ARBs are excellent alternatives to ACE inhibitors. But when they compare ACE and ARB, ACE inhibitors are better than ARB, but non-inferior. Uh, ARB is non-inferior. So if they cannot tolerate ACE inhibitor, ARB is a good alternative to go for. The newest drug, uh, not the newest, it's been here for a couple of years now, but this is a new drug that we are trying uh, from the Paradigm HF trial, uh, RD medication. So this has changed the world of heart failure. It has proven to decrease the heart failure hospitalization, cardiovascular death, and even the secondary points were achieved by reduction of more than 20% as compared to while they were on just ACE inhibitor. So if you compare an RNA or we know it by Entresto, it, there was a 16% reduction, more reduction of death uh, or mortality when they were on ACE or ARB as compared to being on RNA. So the latest guidelines actually suggest if the patients are on ACE inhibitor, they should be switched to RNA. And if they are on ARB, they can be switched too. But when, they're, when you're switching from ACE to RNA, there should be a 36-hour washout period to wait for. Uh, and then it can be now the latest study also mentions that even if they're in the hospital, we can start um, Entresto in the hospital. Um, this is just uh, focusing on the same things that I mentioned uh, from the guidelines. The only thing is for RNA, it applies to NYHA class two and three. It does not apply to one and four. Um, and uh, if they cannot take RNA, or if they have history of angioedema, then you should not be using ARNI. Uh, ARB is an alternative. 
This is a second drug, beta blocker. So there are multiple studies, Merit, HF, Cibis2, Carvedilol trial. And based on these studies, of course, they have proven that these three drugs, metoprolol succinate, not tartrate, bisoprolol, and carvedilol, have proven to decrease mortality by 34% in metoprolol and bisoprolol, and carvedilol gets the biggest decrease in the mortality of almost 65%. So, uh, but not just choosing the drug, choosing the dose and what dose the patients are getting is equally important. Bisoprolol has been studied at a target dose of 10 milligrams a day. That gives you a mortality benefit of 34% that I was talking about. Metoprolol succinate, the patient should get 200 milligrams in a day to receive that 34% benefit and carvedilol 50 milligrams a day to receive uh, in this study, it says 65% reduction, but the 65% reduction is up to 100 milligrams in a day that you can only do if the patients are uh, obese or um, more weight is more than uh, 100 kilograms. Otherwise the benefit you get is 38%. Uh, so based on these studies, these are bisoprolol, carvedilol, and metoprolol succinate reduces mortality and hospitalization, both. Uh, coming to the third drug, which is MRA, mineralocorticoid receptor, we have two big trials, RALS trial and emphasis HF trial. The RALS trial focused on spironolactone, which again proved to decrease heart failure hospitalization as well as decreasing mortality. Emphasis HF was uh, with aplerinon which again decreased the uh, mortality and heart failure hospitalization. We tend to use spironolactone more, but if the patients have his, uh, side effects from spironolactone, gynecomastia or something that uh, we choose, uh, we switch them to epilinone. Uh, two things to look out for when you're starting somebody on aldosterone antagonist would be, the, if one, it can be used from class two to class four, unlike ARNI where we did two and three only, uh, here, uh, even in class four, you can start on spironolactone, but their GFR should be more than 30 and potassium should be less than five. When you're starting them on this medication, you should get baseline BMP. And uh, also after you started on it, there should be a follow-up of the kidney function, potassium, and check with the diuretic dosage that they're getting along with the aldactone. Fourth drug, which is the fourth pillar of the, our four main uh, GDMT, is the SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, we have two main studies, the DAPA-HF trial and the Emperor reduced trial, comparing dapaglofazolin and empaglifazolin. Both of the studies have proven that um, this medication decreases the heart failure hospitalization, decreases mortality, and, is, uh, and should be started even in the hospital if needed. And this is irrespective of their status of diabetes. Uh, so again, class one indication based on the new guidelines, uh, patients should be on SGLT2 inhibitor irrespective of their diabetes status if they have developed a uh, chronic HFREF. So going through the slides after learning about our top main four medications, step one, when you diagnose a patient with a state C HFREF, start GDMT. It can be started all four at the same time. The main goal is to get them on all four medication and then to up it slowly to the maximum tolerated dose. If the patients have low, then it depends. If they have low blood pressure, then you can start one at a time. Uh, but focus on giving them the RAS inhibitors, which is the RNE, better than ACE or ARB, uh, beta blocker, MRAs, SGLT2 inhibitor. And if they are congested, always consider diuretic as needed. If moving to the step two, titration, it's a class one indication to do up titration every one to two weeks until they reach their maximum tolerated dose. Uh, step three would be uh, exceptional patient uh, scenario. So if they're African-American uh, and the NYHA class three and four, uh, hydrolazine and isosorbide nitrate is a class one indication to decrease the mortality. So that would be the patient, African-American population should get this fifth medication on top of those four GDMT. For ICD and CRT, I have separate slides to talk about the indication of when you should be considering ICD and CRT, but th that would be a step four. After putting them on the four pillars, look out for the up titration, then look for the additional scenarios. Step five would be reassess for their symptoms, labs, and EF. Uh, if they are half ref, uh, and if it's not an ischemic cause or non-ischemic cause, then they should get a repeat. Once they are up-titrated to the maximum dose, 
they should get a repeat echo to see if they are converted to the HEF MPEF category. And step six is if they have developed stage D or uh, advanced heart failure, then there comes the advanced therapy or palliative care consult. Uh, so this is about the, the AHEFT trial that uh, was done for isosorbide uh, dinitrate and hydralazine combination, and it did prove to decrease mortality as well as the heart failure hospitalization. Uh, this is a, a, now, those were the class one medications, talking about some additional medications, which after you, after the patients are on those medication, still they are having symptoms, still they are feeling miserable, then you should think about additional therapies, which is equally important. It doesn't, it has not proven to decrease mortality, but definitely proven to decrease morbidity. So the first is the SHIFT trial, where they talked about ivabridin in chronic heart failure. And the study showed that the patients who have NYHA class two to three, and they have chronic HEFREF, EF is less than 35% on GDMT and beta blocker. If they are in sinus rhythm and their heart rate is more than 70, then ivabridin has proven to decrease symptoms, decrease heart failure hospitalization. Why heart failure more than 70 is because ivabridin is a funny channel blocker. It is a sick, it's a sinus node in uh, inhibition, so it can cause bradycardia. So make sure that the patient are having appropriate heart rate before starting this medication. Um, this is the latest trial in 2020, the Victoria trial, where they checked about the very CZUART medication. It's an oral soluble uh, guanylate cyclist stimulator, CGMP is a better way to know that. And that did prove that among the patients with high risk for heart failure, incidence of death, uh, hospitalization, and heart failure was lower as compared to placebo. So actually this medication did prove decreased mortality, but it's still not in the guidelines because th this was the only study done so far. So we need more data about it. These are the additional therapies. It's a, a big slide, but we'll be focusing on the important points. So ivabridin, we already talked about, it's a two-way indication. Uh, moving to the 2B indications. So if the patients are on IV diuretics, their, their requirements are increasing. The EF is less than 45%. NYHA class two to four, then we should add, add varicizuart to that patient. If they still are symptomatic HEFREF, uh, especially if they're AFib, not old population, their kidneys are fine, then that would be the patients where you can consider adding digoxin. Digoxin used to be 2A indication, but now it has moved to 2B because the benefits are less and side effects and toxicity is more with the digoxin. So be very careful when you're starting digoxin and choose appropriate patients. Uh, if they have NYHA 2 to 4, polyunsaturated fatty acid um, administration as in a diet or there is also a medication uh, that is a 2B indication to be added. And then potassium binders, you can use it, especially when the patients are taking uh, uh, medications, which is causing uh, hypokalemia, then these are, will be the medication with the diuretic, you can add potassium binder, but a 2B indication. On the right, these are some additional things which we tend to not remember all the time, but very important for patients to feel better from symptom perspective. So if they have iron deficiency, IV iron replacement, not oral because the absorption would not be great. So IV iron replacement is has proven to improve their symptoms. If they have the EFs, again, that's for the AV nodal operation and CRT impl implantation, which we'll talk in a separate slide, the indications for when to consider for CRT. If they have atrial fibrillation, then if they have recurrent atrial fibrillation, you feel that that AFib is causing them to have symptoms of heart failure or shortness of breath, those will be the candidates who would benefit from AFib ablation. Uh, if the patients have obstructive sleep apnea, they do benefit from CPAP overnight, especially with the obese population that we have, we see in the clinic, if they are, they are on all the medications, but still their shortness of breath is not improving, they still feel fatigue all the time, get a sleep study done and if they start if they are positive for the sleep apnea then choose the CPAP therapy it has shown that it, it does improve symptoms and then of course the cancer related uh, cardiomyopathy the only drugs that have been studied so far which has been useful are ACE and beta blocker ARB if intolerant to ACE uh, but that helps with uh, improving the ejection fraction but uh Stopping the chemotherapy regimen is never the right answer, except if the oncology and then that, that that's why we need a multidisciplinary team approach for the patient. But usually we treat the cardiomyopathy with the cardiac medication and the chemotherapy medication, they continue as they are. 
Um, so this is a, a busy slide, uh, but this is very important of when you're starting. Now you know which drugs to start with, but what dose to start at and what target dose to reach at. So just the common medications, lisinopril, when you're starting them, start at five milligram daily. The goal is to go up to 40 milligram daily. Losartan, if start from 25 to 50 milligram daily, the goal is to go up to 150 milligram daily. And Tresto, if you're starting, start with 24 and 26 combination. The goal is to go up to 97 and 103. Carvedilol, the lowest is 3.125 BID. The maximum is 50 milligram twice daily. Although the 100 did show better benefits, but most of the patient population, the 50 BID is where we stick to. Uh, metoprolol succinate, we start with 12.5 or 25 based on the heart rate blood pressure, go up to 200 milligram once daily. Uh, spironolactone can be started 12.5 to 25, go up to 50 milligram daily. Epilerinone, uh, again, 25 is the starting dose, go up to 50. Both the SGLT2 inhibitor, the starting and the target dose are similar, 10 milligram once a day. This is a, a question sometimes even the residents ask, like if they are, if they, we don't have Bidil all the time. So if there is not a fixed combination, then if we are doing it separately, then how the doses vary. So if we are doing it fixed, then Bidil has this combination of 20 and 37.5 of isosorbida and hydrolysine. It's a three times a day medication and go up to 40 and 75. If we are giving it separately, then isosorbide can be started from 20 to 30 and hydrolysine 25 to 50. Uh, three to four times a day. And the the target dose would be 120 milligram of isosorbide in a whole day and 300 milligram of hydrolazine in a whole day. Uh, Ivabridin, Verisizuart, and Digoxin are medications that we can use as additional therapy. Uh, but uh, Ivabridin, we start at five milligram, go up to 7.5. Verisizuart, 2.5, go up to 10. Digoxin starting at 0.125 to 0.25, the maximum dose depends on the ditch levels. So the goal is to keep it between 0.5 to 0.9, but uh, ditch toxicity should be kept in mind. So the level should be less than 0.9. Uh, these are the indications for the ICD implantation. So patients are 40 days post MI. Look for EF less than 35%. If they are NYHA class two or three, then it's a class one indication for ICD. If they are 40 days post-MI, NYHA class 1, then if, even if the EF is less than 30%, they qualify for the ICD. For CRD, so whenever you're thinking about ICD, the second thought should be, does this patient meet the CRT criteria? So if the EF is less than 35%, they should have a sinus rhythm and a left bundle branch block with more than 150 milliseconds of QRS. That's the patient who would benefit from a CRT defibrillator. Uh, so that was a HEF-REF treatment. Uh, the, this is just one slide on HEF-M-REF, which is a new classification. Uh, the studies done so far, class one indication is only diuretics as needed right now. SGLT2 inhibitors are class 2A indication to be started on the patients. And the other drugs which we use for HEF-REFs is still class 2B for HEF-M-REF. So all those HEF-REF medications is mainly for less than 40% ejection fraction. On the right, it tells that once the patient has improved here, the guideline-directed medical therapy should still be continued. So if they had a history of FREF, do not stop the GDMT. They should still be continued to prevent the relapse of developing LV dysfunction. Moving to the treatment of HEFPEF, there have been multiple studies done so far, but there are not a, any proven medication, which is a class one indication to decrease mortality because HEFPEF is a challenging condition. It is a highly prevalent, most, most significant morbidity and mortality from HEFPEF. And it's a heterogeneous disorder causing, caused by multiple comorbidities, hypertension, obesity, coronary artery disease, CKD, and cardiac amyloidosis. So key points is actually to treat the triggers. So treat underlying blood pressure, uh, diuretics as needed, SGL2 inhibitors is also a class 2A indication here. Treat underlying AFib. We talked about it, AFib ablation if needed as well. Uh, if they have coronary artery disease, uh, treat that and always think about amyloidosis when you are treating heart failure. Only class one is treating heart hypertension. So if you have a diagnosis of HEFPEF, it's very important for them for the blood pressure to be controlled. And second two important things are starting them in a SGLT2 inhibitor and managing their AFib if they have underlying AFib. Last stage, uh, this would talk about how 
important is advanced heart failure, what to look out for and what to do with that. So whenever you're thinking about advanced heart failure, I have a mnemonic here. I need help is the mnemonic. So if the patient meets this criteria, it's important to refer them to advanced heart failure specialist because timely referral is a key to actually prevent uh, from them from having early mortality and improve patient outcomes. So if they are on IV inotropes in patient or even sometimes they're dependent on IV inotropes as outpatient, if they are NYHA class 3B to 4, 3B is the ambulatory stage, uh, the, but then that's, uh, and then they have persistently elevated BNP. It's just not coming down to normal. If they show signs of end organ damage, if they have a renal or liver congestion, cardiorenal syndrome, hepato, cardio, cardio hepato renal syndrome, then those will be the patients where you should be looking for. EF is less than 35%. They might be having ICD because their EF is less than 35%. They are they have been having this NYHA. But after having ICD, if they're telling you that I'm having multiple defibrillator shocks, if they have more than one hospitalization in last one year, if they have edema, persistent edema, despite escalating the diuretics to the maximum possibility, if their blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is less than 90 and their heart rate is high, uh, th that would be the time the, where you cannot uptitrate on your GDMT. And that would be the place where the patients are miserable and symptomatic, but we cannot go up on the medication. And last P is actually the prognostic medication. So progressive intolerance or down titration of the GDMT. You have to go down on your maximum tolerated dose, or you have to stop the medication altogether. These are the flags that you should keep an eye after patients are tr getting treatment for state C and then either refer them to advanced heart failure specialist. We, we would do like a six minute walk test or a CPAT or palliative care, but it's not or, it's actually all the time. When they are stage D, consider palliative care to just come and help with the patient management. So these are the ACC recommendation. Class one indication, consider palliative and supportive care. Talk to them about the goals of care. What do they want? Do they want an, any um, IV inotropes to be taken at home? Do they want LVAD or life support system? Um, and also explain it to them. That's a, also a class one indication that if you are choosing to get this life extending therapies, they have the option of discontinuing it at any time. Once they have started, they got their LVAD or they are on IV inotropes at home, it is, we should follow up with them, still follow up with them regularly to make sure that they are, they, their goals of care have, has, have not switched. So, because it's, this stage is very, very detrimental for the patients, psychosocial and physically both. So that would be the time where you have to do multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and advanced care directives should be talked about when they have reached, reached that stage and then if you feel their survival is less than six months, then hospice um, care should be appropriately enrolled. So talking about after a whirlwind of all the medications, take home points. When the patients are stage A heart failure, treat the risk factors, maintain a healthy lifestyle so that they don't go into the structurally abnormal heart. If they went into that, that would be stage B heart failure. Then that would be the time start ACE inhibitor or ARB if not tolerated beta blocker, if they're post-MI, then start statin. If they develop the symptoms and they enter state C heart failure, start the four pillars of the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That includes RNA, ACE, ARBs, beta blockers, aldectone antagonists, SGLT2 inhibitors. Start them and uptitle them as, as to the maximum tolerated dose for the patient. For African-American population, consider giving adding hydrolyzine nitrate. All these medications have proven to decrease morbidity and mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. If that part is done and then stage they enter stage D heart failure, then the goal would be advanced heart failure management, palliative care approach, discussing goals of care with the patients. And on the right, um, I'm talking about what additional things are important other than the medication. So education of the patient, take, telling them when to take the medication, how to take the medication, how lifestyle uh, modifications are important, counseling them about smoking cessation and uh, if any other substance used, then uh, cessation of that. Cardiac rehabilitation, use it when appropriate. It has proven to decrease symptoms and morbidity in the patients. Consider ICD and CRT as indicated. If they are 
meeting that post MI 40 day criteria of uh, less than 35% of EF NYHA class two to three or less than 30% EF with NYHA class one. Um, or if they are having a left bundle branch block, then consider doing CRTD instead of ICD. For any heart failure, use diuretic as needed to address the congestion. Sometimes patients have diagnosis of heart failure and they're not on any prescription diuretics and then they come with a heart failure exacerbation. So always consider doing that. If they are at the verge of electrolyte abnormality or low blood pressure, you can teach them to take it as needed, measure their weight every day and check for the symptoms and signs. Or when they come to your clinic, you can address it that way. SGLT2 inhibitor applies for all stages of heart failure, including stage A, B, C, D, everything. Uh, and then consider additional therapies that we talked about, IV ion therapy, CPAP, uh, ivabridin, digoxin, vericizuart, PUFA. Uh, these are the medications that help reduce heart failure readmissions and improve patient symptoms. So here are my references and thank you so much. I'm here for the questions. You know, I have to, the interesting part of the of the treatment of heart failure that we see here day in day out is the compliance issue of patients. You know, and you know, I think it's a no brainer having to prescribe all these four medications, and part of that. Is the cost so that's not the whole thing i think you know even if you prescribe the cheaper medications you end up with a compliance problem and uh, whether that's something that can be acted upon i think we did better in the past when we had a dedicated heart failure clinic and these, these have been you know proven to, to kind of decrease three hospitalizations and emissions but these are expensive clinics to to, to form so we're, we're hoping that going to be uh, the case in the long run and especially also part of the heart failure clinic uh, role is to make sure that the, the, the patient's wishes and all of that are going ahead of time. By the time they're admitted, we know where to go with them rather than if they are in the midst of, of, a, of an exacerbation, trying to talk to them about, you know, end life, you know, arrangements and all of that. So I think uh, compliance is, 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 a, is a big issue that we have here, uh, for substance abuse and other things. And uh, that may take a little more effort than you know, than the time that's allowed to us in clinic to kind of go through the important of uh, the binding medications. But the cost is also a problem, especially now adding an SGLT2 which is available for 400 a month, and then we're going to have binding also. So I think that becomes a, a big problem, even with the insurers, uh, even after four days, and you know, some patients find it kind of prohibitive to, to, to pay for those medications. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. And something like if the patient tells you, I'm not taking my medication, it is very important to know why. Are they not understanding the use or is cost to the issue or they do not know how to take it? So when you ask them why, there are multiple answers that you get and half of their answers are fixable. So if that's the case, like Dr. Omar said, compliant. I mean, there are medications out there, but we need to make sure that they're compliant to it for getting the maximum benefit from it. Uh, you had a question. Yes, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is why there is a target dose for uh, ACE inhibitor. Is there any more benefit to use like this 40 milligram compared to 5 milligram, or is it more like a class effect? The second question, I think you mentioned for Entresto, we use it like for NIHAC class 2 and 3. Uh, why we cannot use it in four? Is it like because uh, it's not studied enough in uh, that in stage four, or is it associated with worse outcomes or anything like that? So your first question, yes, the ACE inhibitor, the trial, there are multiple trials done. The benefit, the mortality benefit, the twenty percent reduction and all that I showed is with that maximum 40, 40 milligrams a day of uh, lisinopril. Uh, five something is better than nothing. So even if you do five milligram, if they're tolerating that they will still get the reduction in mortality, but the percentage will be lower than getting the maximum benefit from it. For the RNA, the Paradigm HF trial, that included the patients with class two and three, because for RNA, the biggest issue is uh, hypotension, significant hypotension, decreasing in the GFR. And even the class four were not in, enrolled in the trial. So we don't know uh, if that's beneficial in that population, but the biggest benefit is seen with the two and three. Dr. Omar, if there is anything that 
Yeah, it, it's uh, it's important here. Yeah, any any dose of outer beta blocker or you have to start in you know, start more than five hundred dollars. Now the other important issue is when patients come into our clinics and we say a lot of their blood pressure is, is very well you know controlled at maybe 100, 10, 120, and then they are on small doses and they, they are even not having symptoms, and we say that's fine, we'll see you back in six months. This is not a proper way of treating those patients. As long as they don't have autostatic symptoms and they can tolerate increased their medications, you have to keep targeting the medications to the maximum dose used in the clinical trials. So at that point, you know, if I have a clinical test to become 10 or you can use the BID, uh, even if the blood pressure is normal, you know, because, you know, the target goes that, that have been shown that you want to try to achieve regardless of their, of their symptoms or blood pressure in that case. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's very important again, not to uh, just stop them for you know minor reasons or causes and to the contrary, in the clinical trials have shown the patients are slightly on the lower blood pressure limits and maybe slightly hypertensive benefit more from the Asian inhibitors than even the patients that are hypertensive. So we have to kind of be careful about not to kind of stop. And then again, you know, if the patient is not having orthostatic symptoms, so be it. If the blood pressure is in the 90s, that's fine, you know, as much as we can. Yeah. They have a little bit of perfusion and they can achieve a, a proper dose of medication if that's what you want to be effective in the clinical uh, trials. As, as far as you know, the uh, when to use and at what point, actually, if you if you if you get your patient up to MYHA class one and they're stage C, they're almost no more. You know, it's hard to kind of add the medication and say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna improve things. No, you know, you're not improving uh, morbidity because they're on MYHA class one, they don't have symptoms. And mortality will be also very difficult to prove. So really, the, the only two categories in there you have would be what would be the H inhibitors uh, and the um, uh, or or the R set the kind of patient or the beta blockers in that case. Uh, beyond that, if if you double patient on one class one, it has not seen by myopathy by regards to the UAF, ICD and all other therapies are not really in that category. So the R is not there, the, the, the uh, MRAs are not there, the one spiral like on. You know, only if you remain symptomatic, those are the ones that are increased mobility and mortality, and those are the ones that are Again, the stage four, you know, we're going to have to decide the MRJ class four. You know. Am I going to push them up to stage D and, and do a lot of work on, you know, the device therapy and all that, or should we just stop there and then talk to them about in the part consideration? And then we can get the stage D all together and just go to a, a palliative or hospice care. Uh, in, in the so those are the sickest. It's almost like Comparing an 18 year old and a 90 year old. I, I think most proud would actually exclude both and take some people in the middle that, that you can maybe put some benefit to be able to do it. The only other comment I would make that is discussed in the guidelines is you should also remove other medications that could lower the blood pressure, like they were on amlodipine. You noticed amlodipine is not in the guidelines, it's not going to improve their heart failure, but it's going to make it more difficult in some patients to get them to their target doses of GDMT. So you should stop other medications in favor of choosing the ones that are going to give them the most benefit. So if you run their medication list, and you can knock off some things that might be causing hypotension when you run into that uh, area where you're kind of teetering on whether I can adjust my medications or not. Try to make room so that you can give them the ones that will give them the most benefit in the long term. Exactly. Unless there's a compelling indication that you have maximized all your heart failure medications, and I can it's not harmful to the point. But again, and like Dr. Miller said, and uh, amlodipine is not harmful but not beneficial also. So it may be a blood pressure treatment that you maximize your your guideline therapy. Any other questions? Thank you, Coach. Thank you.